I'm Mitch Horowitz. I'm a historian of alternative spirituality, and above all else, I'm a seeker. I experiment with and participate in many of the occult and esoteric movements I write about, and my work and my search are really one and the same. I grew up in the great borough of Queens in New York City, and it was during the 1970s, and the occult was just in the air. I remember watching robed gurus get interviewed on TV talk shows, and everybody was interested in newspaper horoscopes, and my sister was bringing home the paperbacks of Carlos Castaneda, and I was able to order books on flying saucers and Bigfoot from the Arrow Book Club at my school, and there were all kinds of stories stories going on about ghosts and exorcisms and hauntings and I wanted to know where did all this stuff come from and how did it reach my little neighborhood in Queens and I had the good fortune into adulthood to continue my studies into the esoteric, the paranormal, the occult and I really wanted to start writing the backstory of some of the people who had shaped this occult culture because if you don't write your own story someone else is going to write it for you and they might not understand the values that emanate from your search so that's what gave birth to my first book Occult America which came out in 2009 and I've never stopped If you're new to the occult, there's really no wrong place to start. I would say follow your passions. Follow whatever interests you, whether it's ESP research or some kind of extra dimensional phenomena or whether it's the books of Carlos Castaneda that got me started when I was a kid. Don't let anybody tell you that there's any toll gate that you must pass through or prerequisite. Just follow your own passions and your passions will give you the right starting point. Most of the ideas today that we think of as being oriented toward body-mind-spirit or holistic medicine or positive psychology or motivation, things that most of us regard as very familiar and even domesticated, originally entered the culture from the margins of occult and mystical movements. If you tell someone today to think positive and that a positive mindset can help bring about the outcome, well, that sounds so familiar. It sounds like it's always been with us. If you said that to somebody 150 years ago, they would have looked at you like you were out of your mind. No such concept existed. We have to remember that even concepts of the subconscious mind, for example, only really came into currency as late as the 1890s. Before that time, terms like subconscious conscious and unconscious weren't getting used. There were people who went into mediumistic trances and people who were manipulating bodily energies and who were thought of as occult healers who really arrived at the first concept of the subconscious or unconscious mind. They asked themselves, what is this force that exists in an individual? Call it the imagination, call it what you will, but it makes things happen. It seems to create an ability of second sight or clairvoyance or bodily healing or gives people the ability to speak in languages that they hadn't previously known. All of this got filtered into the idea of the subconscious mind that later emerged in the 1890s. I tell this story only to point out that so much of what we think is familiar and has always been with us is actually quite new. And very often it's entered the culture through occult or esoteric subcultures. The message that I want people to take away from my work is that you have just untold dimensions folded within you. And the most sacred and most empowering thing you can do in life is discover those dimensions. Work with techniques, methods, and ideas, whether those that you learn from other people or those that are of your own devising, and discover the greater dimensions that are within you. I never classify myself as any kind of a guru or teacher. I'm a seeker, and my work is my search. You're a seeker as well. The greatest work you can do in life is just discovering the dimensions and folds within your own psyche. On today's show, Regina and I talked about the emergence of a kind of post magic age that we're living in. We talked about the question of whether the liturgies and ceremonies and rituals and rites that so many of us have grown up with, whether we come from the mainstream traditions or whether we're part of mystical or occult subcultures, are they necessary anymore? Are they necessary? If you accept it as a given 
uh, that you lead an extra physical existence alongside your ordinary physical existence. And I think we've seen enough evidence so that most all of us would accept that there's an extra physical dimension of life. Then it raises the question of whether you need devices, of whether you need special techniques. Perhaps that realization in and of itself is enough for you to begin to discover the folds and the nature of this extra physical existence and what it can be used for, how it can be used to express yourself in the world, how it can be used to pursue your own ethical wishes, needs, and desires in the world. What folds do you have within you that can be brought out to conscious awareness, that can be brought to cognizance just by knowing that they're there, just by knowing that they're there. Isn't prayer, rite, ritual, ceremony, isn't all of that really just a way of trying to unfold these greater dimensions of our existence? And maybe, maybe those techniques were necessary for previous generations, but not our own. And I ask people to experiment with that. Well, that would be peering into a far distant future. And <laughs> I'm not so sure, but I, I do know that we live in an age where we not only have benefited from the testimony of just generations upon generations of seekers, but we see developments in the mainstream sciences, in neuroplasticity, in placebo studies, in quantum theorizing, in psychical research that tell us, that inform us, that use clinical models to demonstrate the mind has an actual concrete effect over the body, that information can be transferred in anomalous ways in laboratory settings and that these things can be repeated. You might call that ESP. And there's all kinds of other ways in which we are able to verify, to verify that we have an extra physical existence. And it, it just presents our generation with a tremendous opportunity. Now that we know this, what do we do with it? And that's a very personal question for every individual. There is a ritual that I do twice, almost without exception, in every 24-hour period. And that is, I use what is called the hypnagogic state. And very simply, hypnagogia is that extremely relaxed state that you find yourself in when you're hovering between sleep and wakefulness. It happens naturally every 24 hours, just as you're drifting to sleep at night and just as you're coming to in the morning. Brain researchers and psychical researchers have found that that is prime time in effect, not only for reprogramming your psyche, but also for instances of psychical phenomena as measured in laboratory settings. And I would ask everybody to experiment with those beautiful relaxed moments, hold an image, hold a visualization, recite an affirmation. It can serve to recondition the psyche and it can also serve, I believe, to do much more. These natural meditative states occur twice every day. You're in it for just a few moments. You're in a dreamlike, very relaxed state, but you still have cognition. Use it, that's my message, use it. That's something I do twice a day. I have a 3 p.m. ritual every single day, Eastern time, although if I'm in a different time zone, I don't think I'm going to get hampered or hung up by convention. I have a ritual at 3 p.m. each day where I invite people to enter what I call the Miracle Club, which is just to enter into a few moments of silent prayer and meditation for our ethical wishes. Sometimes people feel isolated and I always tell them that forget about the boundaries of geography or physicality. You can join me every day at 3 p.m. I typically do it at 3 p.m. Eastern, but the fact is I don't want to get hung up on the cycles of the clock. What's more important is that we're reaching out to each other once a day, every day, to just for a few moments hold a wish for one another's ethical needs and desires. I've gotten better at this. I cannot tell you the number of interviews in which my phone alarm has interrupted me, but it usually opens up a good question of, why is your phone on during this interview? It is purposeful, although I've gotten better about not letting it interrupt.